U.S. Navy submarines have operated under the ice for decades. The first one reached the North Pole in 1958. The captain of USS Nautilus wrote in a message at the time, embarked following personage at North Pole, Santa Claus, affiliation, Christmas. We'll have more to say about Santa Claus later in season three, but we've wanted to talk to someone who has actually operated under the ice. Today, we're honored to have as our guest, Commander Sean Flanagan, who was the captain of the nuclear-powered submarine USS Pasadena. Many thanks to our sponsor for this episode, Culligan Water. With Culligan's drinking water systems, you can get the ultra-filtered water you need to fuel your high-performance lifestyle right on tap. Learn more at Culligan.com. We caught up with Commander Flanagan not long after he transferred from command of USS Pasadena. So, Commander Sean Flanagan, welcome to the Adrenaline Zone, and thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, sir, for the invite. Uh, so it's a pleasure. I'm uh, really excited to talk about some of the things that uh, that uh, me and my crew have done over the past uh, couple of months. Well, we're really looking forward to it as well. And uh, I suppose, you know, th- we have always wanted to interview somebody who's been under the ice because that seems like it's risky and, and interesting and with a lot of adrenaline. Uh, and I would say operating a submarine under the ice sort of gives a new m- meaning to the term Cold War. Uh, so and you've been there several times. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually looking forward to the conversation because there's a lot of parallels between living on the space station and living in a submarine. But before we get to what you guys were doing in the last few months. Let's start at the very beginning. So what got you interested in the Navy and and what caused you to join in the first place? I originally joined uh, about a year after I graduated high school. I enlisted in the in the Navy as a uh, nuclear electrician's mate um, when I was 19. Uh, really, the, the not a whole lot of reason there other than uh, I was looking for a direction and um, opportunities and then and the Navy provided them. And and what I found out very quickly that he, you know, put it, put some effort in and, and perform and kind of do what you're told and uh, go a little bit extra. The opportunities just continue to open up for you. And uh, so I, I very quickly, um, you know, advanced in enlisted ranks. And then from the first opportunity I had, I put in for an officer package and I was selected for a a commissioning program, and the Navy sent me to North Carolina State University. I got my chemical engineering degree, and I finished with a commission. And I've, uh, you know, just now completed just over 25 years in, in the Navy service. Um, you know, starting off as a as an E1 in, in boot camp, and and just recently being relieved as commanding officer in a, a submarine. So, well, for our listeners, it's really a big deal to to be able to to come in uh, as an enlisted. Uh, a nuclear electrician's mate, which is hard enough training and, and a very rigorous job and, you know, lots of bonuses and, and, you know, very, very high quality people. But it's a pretty big deal to go from there to being uh, commissioned as an officer and then certainly ultimately uh, as the captain of uh, Pasadena. So tell us a little bit about your progression as an officer. What did you have to do before you could become the captain of a submarine? Well, it's a, it's a long process, as, as you can imagine, um, you know, most of the officers on a submarine, they're all nuclear trained, uh, with the exception of our supply officer. So the, with the, the remainder of all the other officers are nuclear trained. We all start off in the same place. We go to nuclear power school in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and we'll get continued uh, nuclear training. Um, so we spend about a year and a half of just getting basic nuclear operator training. And then we go to a first submarine uh, where we'll operate as a division officer. You know, we'll be in charge of one division, maybe a machinery division or electrical division. Uh, and we do that for our first tour. And we learn how to drive the submarine and, um, and manage contacts while we're submerged and, and how the sonar system operates. So that first tour for a junior officer is basically learning everything that you can about being a submarine officer and uh, everything you can about the submarine itself. And uh, as soon as you know everything or think you know everything, they send you to a shore duty. And uh, you get a little bit of a break, and then you go right back and you do as a department head. Uh, submarines have four department heads. Um, three of those are nuclear trained. Again, everybody goes through the same pipeline, same opportunities to do that for a couple of years, and then uh, go to a shore duty, and then come back as an executive officer. Um, uh, the, the submarine force is a little unique, and the others is that we don't fleet up from EXO to CO. So after we finish an EXO tour, we'll go to shore duty, um, and they'll 
go back through a training program to be a commanding officer. That training program for a commanding officer, that pipeline process is about, you know, give or take a couple of months, but it's about a year long. Um, do extensive training in nuclear power. So at the beginning, when we learn about nuclear power, we're kind of learning it about in general terms. And, you know, this is, this is kind of how it works. And, and you may, you, your mileage may vary when you get to your submarine. But in the uh, process of uh, preparation for being in command, I mean, I went to naval reactors in D.C. for for a number of months, and I knew that I was going to go to the Pasadena. And I knew, you know, everything, every piece of equipment that that submarine had, how many alterations it had, how many modernizations it had, all the different problems that it may have had over the 33 years of its service life. But I learned everything there was to know about that particular um, ship. Then I would go to a tactical performance course where they, um, the, the commanding officers, the prospective commanding officers do uh, about a month or so of classroom training and do a high fidelity simulation trainers. And we do about another month at sea. So what they'll actually do is they'll take uh, all these, uh, you know, some, you know, two or three submarines that are, that are available and they'll put the prospective commanding officers and prospective executive officers on those submarines for a couple of weeks and basically make us play the role of, of, of XO or CO and uh, to kind of to, to learn the, you know, the final step to how to put all that theory into application and into command and leadership roles. And so that's the, you know, everybody who was in my position went the same role all the way from the beginning to, 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 to now. So it's quite an investment. By the time you get to be the captain of a sub, you've had at least three submarine tours. You probably have four because you start off as an enlisted uh, submariner and then all this other uh, training and preparation. And then you then you get to the boat. Uh, is there any other like special selection criteria or psychological screening? You know, you check people for claustrophobia. I know Sandra had to do that uh, as an astronaut. Yeah, a lot of those things are taken care of uh, in the initial accessions process. Um, there are some psychological screenings and just, just asking simple questions or, you know, are you claustrophobic? And, and then maybe uh, the submarine force is not the place for you, but the Navy will probably find a place for you under, under those circumstances. <laughs> um, I will say that in the, uh, in the recent years, that, that sort of mentality of considering the, the, the not just mental health, but um, mental resilience and uh, it, in emotional health has has gone into not necessarily the selection process, but in the development process. So um, as an example, um, prior to my executive officer tour, um, I did, you know, several, you know, hour long surveys. I did interviews with uh, operational psychologists and he sort of, uh, you know, kind of gave, uh, I, I wouldn't say did any sort of a clinical analysis, but, you know, this is, this is how you best operate. And, uh, you know, when bad things happen or when stress happens, this is how you, you tend to react and, and sort of it's, it helps to develop the self-awareness to, uh, to, to kind of proceed in, in times of stress. And, uh, they continue to develop that process. And, uh, you know, just the other day we're, we're getting, um, sort of notification that they want to increase that and, and make sure that the, uh, you know, the, the folks that are doing the selection of, you know, leadership in the submarine force understand what the operational psychologists are, are, are talking to us about. So operating under the ice, why did the Navy decide that that was a place to be in the first place, that that was a, a, a domain where they definitely wanted to send submarines for long periods of time? You know, in, in 2009, President Bush signed the, the National Security Presidential Directive 66, which which basically said that uh, our role in the Arctic is to a certain active and influential national presence to protect those interests and to project sea power throughout the region. Um, and, you know, this, it's been carried forward all the way through to the present day. Um, there are no Arctic treaties for the uh, eight Arctic nations. So we kind of all agree that, hey, this is, this is an area that, um, that we want to be familiar with. And, and particularly the submarine force is one of the best suited assets to protect that uh, that resource and project sea power in the region. You know, of the the allies that we have, there are eight Arctic nations, um, and then there are some competitors that have Arctic borders. 
And, uh, you know, submarines, particularly United States, nuclear submarines are kind of the only show in town when it comes to to getting deep into the Arctic mm. um, to the tune that uh, 1958, the USS Nautilus was the first um, really vessel to, to be in the vicinity of the North Pole. And a year later in 1959, the USS Skipjack went back to the North Pole, but this time surfaced through it. And it's always been a constant uh, drumbeat on, a, on an annual basis or, or even more frequently to get a submarine back into the Arctic. And every time we go, we go under those same, same general uh, pretenses of projecting sea power and, and, and creating a, an influence in the region. Has the dynamics changed a little bit since the ice is melting in certain places and it's not really under the ice so much? Or is that not really affected? Seasonally, the ice, the ice changes from um, like completely covered. Uh, and then in the spring and summertime, it melts and it does recede. And, and currently, it, it, it may be receding a little bit more um, than, than it has in the past. But when you look at it on, you know, it's on a on a micro scale, which is, you know, when I have gone out there, there, were, there was a lot of ice and um, <laughs> pretty much everywhere we operated was covered in ice okay. and uh, to the tune of a couple of feet to, uh, to, 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 to higher. Wow. Um, but, but certainly, certainly there are expectations that, you know, there's an economic uh, value to, to sea lanes that may open up in the Arctic based on, you know, either, either long-term or seasonally receding ice lines. Right. You're passionate about pushing yourself always to be better. Culligan's water experts feel the same. That's why their smart reverse osmosis filtration systems do more than deliver the ultra-refreshing, pure-tasting water you deserve. Their Aetna also lets you set drinking water goals, see water quality information, and get filter change alerts. And with cleaner, safer, great-tasting water available right from the tap, you can also feel good about all those single-use plastic bottles you're saving from landfills. Get started today by scheduling your free water test at Culligan.com. So you're out there under the under the theory that if if you're not there, then somebody can claim this or, you know, uh, like other places in the world where we protect our rights to navigation and and other um, rights under the law of the sea treaty and that sort of thing. Uh, so so you're out there. And one of the great things about having you on the adrenaline zone, Sean, is that you've been there and you've been there quite a lot. You have recent experience uh, under the ice with Pasadena. Uh, how many times have you been under the ice yourself? And uh, what exactly is an ISEX that uh, that you might have participated in? Well, I need to correct one thing. Um, this was actually my first time operating into the ice. Okay. Um, and, and interestingly enough, that question was asked when I was underway. We had the opportunity to take a couple of media guests underway with us, and we were submerged in the ice with them and surface and operating the ice. And uh, uh, the question I was asked by one of those media guests was, you know, how many times have you done this? And I had to tell her it was... <laughs> Well, <laughs> counting yesterday, this is my second time. You mean you've never done this? <laughs> I love it. Yes, and, uh, and, and, and so, um, and in sobering lane, you know, I would say the vast majority of my crew had never operated under the ice. Now, plenty of them had operated in the Arctic and in what we call the marginal ice zone, um, or in, in cold waters that, that have you know issues that we have to concern ourselves with. But but operating under the ice with the intent of conducting exercises and ultimately surfacing through the ice it is not is not done frequently and generally not done outside of an ice exercise um, there are some exceptions but majority of the time those are there there's there's a reason we do that and the ice exercises are are they have additional set of of goals uh objectives and it changes from year to year whatever is most important um to the to the to the fleet to the force or to you know the government organizations that that uh, to give us direction. So what is it like down there? You, know, you mentioned the ice goes from a few feet thick and to some unknown depth. And are you constrained in your depth window, depending on where you are? And how much stress does that add to the crew when they're operating in that manner? Yeah, we can be very constrained. Um, you know, to, to answer this question, I sort of have to give a little bit of discussion on on how ice is formed. And I went in there thinking that, you know, all the water just freezes and it's just a nice ice sheet of uh, varying uh. thickness. But it turns out that uh, these, when ice forms, 
um, the different flows can kind of crash into one another. And instead of fusing together, they create the one, like one will go under the other one and they create these long, uh, very deep uh, ice structures that are called ice keels. And they can go down to, you know, 200 feet deep. Huh. Um, and so the Arctic base is actually very deep. But in order to get there, we have to go through places that are not very deep. You know, the Pacific side, you have to go through Bering Strait, and that is not a, a not deep. Uh, and, and the route that I took on through the Atlantic side went through the Nary Strait, which is a body of water in between Greenland and Canada, and that's also not very deep. So you've got these things over you that are coming down 200 feet, and you have the ground that is that is coming up at you. Um, you know, you can be very constrained. I mean, to the tune of, of several meters. Um, huh. above and below you. Wow. So I guess you're not going very fast when you go through those narrow places. You, you know, you uh, not take your all. time, very careful with your navigation uh, and the like. So, so I was going to ask you is, uh, is, you know, is it, is it jagged or flat? But I think you've already answered that question. So how do you know uh, what's above and what's in front of you when you're going through that? Because, you know, if you've got an ice keel in front of you, it's kind of nice to know it's there, right? Yes, sir. Um, one of the, the, uh, the certification processes of going into an ISEX or operating under the ice is we will, we will train the crew on how to, how to operate, but we also certify our equipment to make sure that uh, our sensors are tuned exactly properly to give us the most accurate information about what's above us and what's in front of us. Um, so we do have, um, you know, active sensors, active sonar sensors that kind of project in front of us. Uh, to the side of us and on the top of us and below us um, to tell us how deep the water is or how close the, the, uh, the seabed is. Um, and all of those kind of operate in concert, you know, to, to make sure that we are safe in, in our space of the water that, uh, that we want to be in. And, you know, if we're driving and we're not going to know that there is something in front of us until it gets relatively close, to be honest with you. And so the, the, op, the, the teams have to be, be trained to all right, uh, this, we have an ice keel in front of us and, you know, we have some, some limited number of yards to, to react and immediately the, the ship control parties, our helms have to put the rudder like hard over to avoid missing this. And man, it, it's, and it's day in, day out, hour in, hour out. It's, you know, you're watching the sensors and as soon as you get indication that you got something in front of you, you got to turn. And I guess if, if, it's, if that ice keel is between you and your destination, you got to find a way around it, right? Yes. I, I think of the ice keels to kind of visualize them. They're sort of like, uh, you know, the stalactites that form in caves. You know, they're, they're not, uh, you know, impenetrable walls. They, they're relatively easy to go around. Um, but if a submarine were to hit one inadvertently, um, it would do significant damage to, uh, you know, some of the more sensitive components on a submarine. So, so we, we definitely take great care to, to avoid those. And, um, and depending on where you are in the Arctic, they can be, they can be relatively um, shallow and, and spaced far apart, or they can be relatively close together and deep, and, and you're constantly maneuvering the submarine just to get to your destination. Wow, you know, I think I think we have one up on you on the space station. We have windows, and I'm pretty sure you don't have windows, and that's the and that's a big deal when you have a window. <laughs> we so we do have a we do have a um, some add-on equipment when we go so. I would say that every submarine, at least every fast attack submarine that the United States build, we build them, you know, their, their, their stock build, they can go and operate under the ice. Um, but we do get some additional equipment, sort of add-ons from our Arctic submarine lab um, to help us operate in that domain. Um, one of them is an upward facing camera. So it's got a relatively low light capability and a very small field of view, but it looks straight up. So. Um, when we are going through the ice and we're trying to find a, a suitable place to surface, we can look up to make sure that, you know, the ice is relatively flat um, and uh, we're not misreading our sensors. Um, so not, not a window, but as a camera. Does that help you determine how thick uh, the ice is or do you have some other method of, because you know, if you're going to, we'll get into surfacing through the ice in a minute, but I would imagine if it's brighter, it's thinner, but is, is it rough or is it, you have a pretty good feel? You can use a pretty good feel with the uh, with the camera if it's if it's light. Um, the real thing that you can tell with the camera is it should be a consistent color. Um, if there's any uh, oh, ice keels, mm -hmm. they'll create a lot of a lot of shade and shadows, and it's re readily apparent. 
Uh, when we went up there, it was uh, relatively, you know, 24 hours worth of daylight. So it was uh, relatively useful for us. You know, mm -hmm. if you were going to use it um, during the times of, you know, 24 hours of darkness, it probably wouldn't be as much useful. Uh, but the, and the camera was sort of a, uh, it's kind of a nice to have. It was, it was good to, to look at. Um, but ultimately, the, the, our sonar sensors, our upward facing sonar sensors, which would tell us how deep the ice was, is kind mm -hmm. of the primary thing we, we would use. Yeah. So, um, Sean, all of our subs uh, have one nuclear reactor. And, and thanks to the amazing nature of the Navy's program that designs, builds, maintains, trains people to run those reactors, they're some of the most reliable machines on the planet. Uh, but you still have to plan for some kind of contingency, I'm sure. And it's got to be different if you're under the ice and, you know, especially under ice that's not suitable for surfacing. Uh, if you have some sort of an emergency where you have to scram your reactor or something like that. Surely, you know, obviously you're, you have that as, uh, on your mind at all times. Your crew is really well trained. But how do you feel? How does that sort of increase the pucker factor as you're driving around under the ice? Quite, quite a bit. Um, you know, I've been at this, the Navy nuclear power for, for 25 years, and there are, have been very few instances where we've been driving around under the water and have a problem with the reactor and have to do something about it. You know, uh, it just doesn't happen. They are really, really reliable. Uh, but, but just to your, to your point, um, you know, the time, you know, Murphy's Law will have it to have a problem under the ice. It, uh, it, it is a lot more consequential. So part of our training process is not just training the ship's control party, how to operate uh, the, and maneuver the submarine under the ice, but we do some significant training in our, in our engineering department. And, you know, these are the sort of casualties which would remove propulsion and, and what do we do and how do the rules sort of change under the ice where the consequences are, are more significant. Um, so certain, certain casualties that, uh, you know, we kind of just, I don't want to say we don't worry about it in normal circumstances, but in normal circumstances, um, by normal, I mean, up, you know, just submerged in, in water that uh, doesn't have ice on top of it. If the worst thing happens, you always can go to the surface. You know, we have a, a sub safe program that was established after the, uh, the, um, the loss of the USS Thresher. And one of those principles in the sub safe program is a submarine will be able to go to the surface through emergency means, like an emergency blow, as we call it. But when you're under the ice, that option is not there anymore. You know, um, we do an emergency blow onto the ice and the ice isn't, isn't thin enough for us to go under. We're just going to bounce off the ice canopy and, and, and we can lose the submarine. So we spend an awful lot of time making sure that the engineering department knows exactly what to do um, to, to operate in this domain under, you know, casually uh, conditions, we'd go the extra mile. We actually do some practice. And, um, you know, when we have these reactor scrams, you know, there's a limited amount of time that we have. We have a battery, uh, a submarine battery that, that gives us propulsion and, and runs our electric equipment and, and things of those nature uh, while we get the reactor back up. So one of the reasons or one of the requirements to go under the ice is to kind of stretch the legs of the battery uh, we'll do a thing called rig, uh, rig for reduced electrical. So we basically shut everything off in a submarine. Uh, the lights people carry around flashlights and, you know, all our sonar systems are down with the exception of just the one or two that need to, that we need to safely operate the ship. Um, our hydraulic systems go into like an emergency mode that they don't use a lot of power. And so the whole goal there is to stretch the limits of the battery while we have the opportunity to get the, the, the reactor back up. And it turns out they are well designed and, and I, we made it through the entire uh, under ice operations, uh, any, any, any reactor problems with the uh, propulsion plant problem for that matter. On ISS, we train extensively for two, two really major ones, a fire and a depressurization. Those are emergencies we train extensively. There's kind of bold faced, you know exactly what to do. I imagine you guys do something similar. And, you know, Sandy talked about the shutdown, but how do you deal with other emergencies, regardless of whether you're under the ice or not? You mentioned an emergency blow, but you'd probably try and fight the situation first, right? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting. You, you mentioned the uh, corollary between the, the astronaut very own. So our, our two casualties that we are most concerned with are, are also fire, but instead of depressurization, it's, I would call it a, 
Overpressure is yeah. for flooding. <laughs> yeah. So uh, some, some corollary there. And uh, oh, certainly, yeah, the, the goal there is to, you know, to combat the, the mm-hmm. initial casualty to, so that the, the small fire in, in the, the ship's laundry doesn't turn into a large fire. Yeah. Um, or, you know, but when, when it comes to flooding, you know, our normal process for flooding might be just to go to the surface, you know, yeah. we'll deal with it later kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Um, on this, you know, the options like we'll, we'll, we'll minimize our depth to minimize that flooding rate while we combat the casualty. You know, for the fire on space station, the first thing that happens when the smoke detector goes off is that all the ventilation stops, you know, to, to quit feeding the oxygen to the fire. Do you guys do something similar? Yes. The, um, our, our rigs for fire will, will shut off the ventilation. It, it sort of starves of oxygen. Plus it keeps the, the smoke from getting elsewhere in the submarine. And uh, kind of localizes the, the, the concerns to the immediate vicinity. Yeah, a lot of parallels. Water is the ultimate health drink. With Culligan's filtration systems, you'll get the superior quality and pure tasting, ultra refreshing hydration you can count on to power your performance. Culligan's smart reverse osmosis systems take it to the next level, helping you set hydration goals track how much you're drinking, and even see what contaminants are reduced in your water. That means you're always getting the exceptional water you need to feel truly good inside and out, ready to face the day and whatever challenges it brings. Learn more at Culligan.com. You know, one of the things that really uh, struck me when I was on Annapolis, and it was a, a big reminder for me, was the importance of experience. And I remember watching the CO when we were doing a submarine versus submarine thing. And, and, you know, you guys are so quiet. You're so hard to find that he was the guy who saw on the sonar at the very last second. And it, it's not lost on me that, you know, the captain, the chief of the boat, the executive officer, you guys are so critically important in these evolutions, but it must also feel so good when you see your crew able to kind of do it with you just watching. It is. And it's, it becomes an art too, in uh, being in the right place at the right time. And, um, and sometimes it's as simple as, you know, me or the, the, the cob or somebody just asking a simple question and then creating, you know, the, the, the pause in somebody's uh, thinking, they, they reconsider what they're doing and they already know the right answer. And they just needed somebody to, to say, Hey, did you think about that particular aspect? Um, and it, it does come with experience and, and that's one of the things that they you know, that I find very useful about. The, the way we set up our, our commanding officers for success. Yes, I would, I would uh, mention to our listeners really quickly, because uh, one of the philosophies behind this podcast is that, you know, half the people in the world who take risk are women. And uh, we have our first female chief of the boat. Uh, you mentioned the Cobb. Uh, and I know the submarine service is really proud of that. Uh, it's, it's been a while to, to have women work their way up through the submarine force. And it's, it's good to see that that's happening. In between these sessions, these training sessions and these exercises, what does the crew do when it's off duty to relax? Because there's a certain amount, you know, that helps break down the stress and the, the fatigue. So, I mean, on space station, we can look out the window. <laughs> you guys don't have windows. <laughs> yeah, I, I, have, I have found that uh, we, we try to provide outlets um, for for sailors, things like movies, and they have t- books and that kind of stuff. But what I will say that in in high risk, high intensity operations, um, a lot of their off duty time is spent preparing for their on duty time, and uh, and then we still have to do things like laundry and eat and uh, and, and 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 clean that kind of stuff. So oftentimes when we're doing the high intensity operations. Um, you know, there's not a lot of time for that. Ideally, submarines and, and, and pretty much, you know, any military uh, unit tries to find time for, for leave uh, when it makes, makes the most sense. But, but I, I will say that um, majority of time under the ice, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, fun going on. We did have an opportunity to, uh, as we were transiting to the North Pole, um, do a, we call a, a, a blue nose ceremony. Where it's kind of this is the same thing you would do if uh, you know a, a ship or a submarine crosses the Arctic and you do a shell back uh, cr- Arctic crosses the equator and does a, a shell back ceremony. Um, this kind of thing to find you know, do uh, Nintendo tournaments and, and that kind of stuff. But but really, I would say 
most folks, uh, they were really keyed into what we were doing and uh, that with the stress involved in their operations, um, they were pretty quick to, you know, I need to get some sleep so I'm ready and fresh to do this the next day. Do you guys have a gym on board for people to work out and relieve stress that way? Or is it too cramped quarters? It's cramped. I mean, we will try to get equipment underway. And we, we have found a way. Every submarine class has figured out a way to get a treadmill somewhere in the submarine. Exercise bikes, uh, rolling machines, things that have relatively smaller footprints. We can kind of cram them into the nooks and crannies, uh, free weights, exercise bands. We, we do have those, those opportunities. And uh, well, yeah, we, we, we try to maximize use of those when, when we have them on board. Yeah, I mean, we have to exercise for physiological reasons, but it's also a great stress relief. And our equipment's also very tiny. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, they have to strap you in. So, Sean, I know that you mentioned earlier the submarine service is the silent service. Um, uh, so just curious if there are any unclassified sort of hairy stories you can share or uh, if you tell us, you'll have to kill us. You know, one of the things that... Uh, I wouldn't say a, a, a scary story, um, but I went there, you know, letting you know that this is our first time doing this, you know, and the majority of the crew had never surfaced through the ice. And, uh, and so we kind of went in there with the expectation that this was going to be hard and we were going to learn as we, we went. We did a little practice uh, on some of the evolutions like surfacing under the ice. Um, we didn't, we did it our local operating waters and we kind of went through the motions and we didn't do everything because it's really not safe in, in local waters to, to, to stop the submarine and then go up and surface. Uh, in any case, we, we spent a lot of time practicing surfacing the submarine. Um, and so even though there was a learning curve associated with it, um, we did pretty, pretty well on that. We didn't really realize until we got there and we were actually on the surface surrounded by ice that we hadn't really talked about how to get back down. <laughs> um, you know, we had a procedure for it. Uh, we yeah. had a procedure for it. And, um, but uh, it was, it was, the first time was, was quite ugly. Um, and so I, so I told you when we surface the ship, we kind of blow some ballast out of our main ballast tanks. And so in order to resubmerge the ship, you got to get all that water back in the ballast tanks. So we had the tanks. Um, normally, when we're operating in in our normal waters, the the boat is driving forward at about ten or so knots when we submerge the ship. So the ship is actually positively buoyant, and we drive it down. But under the ice, or on top of the ice, when you're surf uh, submerging a ship, you don't have that forward momentum to drive the ship down. So you have to basically do a controlled sinking in the submarine. You have to make it heavier than water, and it has to go down, and it has to get deeper than all these ice keels before you can start moving forward. And while you're wow, sinking the submarine deeper and deeper and deeper, you don't have your control surfaces. Your main engines aren't warmed up because you're doing all these things in the meantime. Um, and so just, uh, I was not that anxious about it because I sort of, sort of did the math in my head, but there were a lot of concerned faces in control, you know, as the depth is getting deeper and deeper and deeper and we're not moving anywhere. So I wouldn't say it was a, you know, hearing our, you know, moments, but, but certainly you could see on the sailor faces, particularly the more junior ones, when something didn't feel right, um, there was, there was a thinly veiled, like, uh, concern. Um, <laughs> it's like, what? like what's going well, on? It's, yeah. it's just, it's not uh, hairy, but it's way different. I would imagine. I, I imagine you get, you know, wedged in the ice too. It might be hard, you know, hard to get down. Uh, I never really thought of that. Uh, it, it, it's impossible. Him. Yeah. So I, I remember seeing a picture one time of some polar bears, uh, snooping around a submarine that had surfaced through the ice. Did you, did you guys have any company up there at all? Or, uh, <laughs> What did you do when you got up there? <laughs> we we did. We wanted to see some polar bears, but that was that was not in the cards for us. Um, you know, some of the pictures you see, uh, you know, like I said, the Arctic is huge. Um, a lot of those polar bears don't get too far away from from land. Um, they're just not, at least as far as I understand, they're not walking around the North Pole. They you know they kind of get off the coast of uh, uh, Canada or, or Alaska and they don't get too far into the ice covered areas. Um, and we didn't really operate there. We operated a little higher up in the Arctic. Uh, mm -hmm. No uh, Santa sightings or anything like that? Well, 
Our, it's arguable. I mean, uh, one of our <laughs> one of our Liberty events, we we were at the, we were at the North Pole, and uh, we actually met up with another submarine at the North Pole. Um, the USS Illinois was there with us. They actually joined us from the Pacific side, and we came up from the Atlantic side, and we met up at the North Pole, and um, and we brought a Santa costume with us, and uh, one of our sailors dressed up as Santa Claus, and we took pictures, and and uh, you know. It's going to be a lot of our postcards and Christmas cards for uh, this holiday season. Very That's cool. Perfect. Very, very <laughs> cool. So, Sean, I, I imagine that you really benefited from lessons learned from other folks who have done this before you. Um, and no doubt you have been expected to write up a, your own report. Uh, were there, uh, you must learn every, something every time a submarine goes under the ice. Did any any particular lessons this time that you can share? Or there, there may be classified lessons we wouldn't want to get into, obviously, but any. Is is the learning curve still steep, or is it pretty well understood how you need to to do this? Yeah, the learning curve is still steep. I, I think we try to every time we go do something new and something different to try to you know push the envelope. Um, but you know, when I said that it was my first time operating the ice, uh, you know, the, I leveraged all those lessons learned of previous operators under the ice. So the I mentioned earlier the Arctic Submarine Lab. It's um, you know, it's, it's our clearinghouse from all things Arctic. And they, they're the ones that put the equipment on us. They're the ones that kind of give us all the training. They'll actually send what are called the Arctic operations specialists on the submarine with us. And they have operated under the ice before. Um, you know, they're, they're colloquially referred to as ice pilots, but they're, uh, you know, they come with a, a heavy amount of experience. You know, my ice pilot, uh, Brian Reed had done this a number of times. Uh, but we'll also go and, and, you know, he would give me the report when, as an example, the USS San Juan did ISEX in, I think it was 1993. And so the, the San Juan is, is basically like the same make and model um, with all the trimmings that the Pasadena has. So I could look at the, uh, the, the San Juan's report and, and, and I, can, I can see exactly how they did certain things. You know, I might not know how long that uh, I need to blow the emergency ballast tanks to, to surface the ice, but this report said, you know, you do it for three seconds here or two seconds there, or whatever the case may be. So, you know, we, we leverage all those lessons learned and, and you kind of look at all those reports um, over, the, over the past, uh, you know, probably uh, 60, 70 years. The Arctic Submarine Lab has about 100 or so different different versions of either ice axes or operations under the ice that all those lessons learned are just, we're just building up on top of them. And, and yes, I, I was responsible to, to create, um, you know, a document upon completion, as well as my Arctic operations specialist. Uh, he, he captured a couple of things that were, were new and unique um, to this operation. Well, Sean, uh, congratulations to you and your crew for a, a successful tour as a captain of a submarine and for a, a, a obviously a really interesting ISEX. It's really cool as a, as a commanding officer of anything to be able to do something that isn't always done. And I know you really relish that experience. And we, uh, it's been a, a delight talking to you and uh, we really wish you the best of, of luck with the rest of your career as you move forward. And uh, hopefully you're getting a little break with your family. So thanks again for being with us and thanks right. for your service. Thanks for chatting with us. It was really super interesting. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was former captain of the submarine USS Pasadena, Commander Sean Flanagan. I'm Sandra Magnus. And I'm Sandy Winnefeld. Thanks again to Culligan Water for sponsoring this episode. Get exceptional water for exceptional performance. Learn more at Culligan.com. Check us out on social media, including a short video of our interview with Sean on TikTok. Our handle is very simple, at The Adrenaline Zone.